My guest at this time is Phil Kirpin. He is president of American Commitment. He joins me today to talk about a frustration for millions of American families, the high cost of prescription drugs. Americans pay more for their medications than anyone else in the world. And for the next few minutes, we'll discuss why that is and why Mr. Kirpin believes the Trump administration is taking both good steps and bad steps to address the issue. And Phil, thanks very much for being with us. My pleasure, Greg. Thanks for having me. Well, first of all, let's establish the state of the problem here. Drug prices obviously can be brutally expensive for families, especially when there's no generic alternative yet. We're also seeing uh, high prices for things like insulin. Uh, The left says the pharmaceutical companies are greedy. The right often says developing drugs and getting them to market is expensive. So these drug makers have to get their money back somehow. But what's really happening and why are we paying more than the rest of the world for them? Well, developing new drugs is extraordinarily expensive. Uh, on average, it costs about two and a half to three billion dollars to bring a new drug to market. There are lots of reasons for that. Uh, some of it is the regulatory cost, which, of course, we'd like to see trimmed back. Uh, but a lot of it is just there's so many failures for every one success, and you have to sort of average those in. And it's a very expensive, highly speculative endeavor. And the way the global market has developed, which is extraordinarily unfair to Americans, uh, you know, pretty much all the other rich countries have some form of government price controls. And so they set prices uh, far lower than what what a market clearing price would be uh, through through government policy. And they tend to set prices a little bit higher than the marginal cost of producing, you know, one more pill or one more injection. And so the uh, pharmaceutical companies can make a little bit of uh, profit uh, on the margin there, which is why they sell in these countries, um, even though the prices are government price controlled. But what drives research and development, which what covers the cost of that two and a half to three billion dollars for a new drug and a return on capital for investors um, is the U.S. market. The U.S. market is really driving uh, all of the hundred billion, hundred fifty billion a year in research and development that's being spent globally. It's really being driven by the ability to get a market return in the U.S. market, and the rest of the world essentially gets a free ride. And so that's why we've got this huge disparity in prices. Uh, And it is extraordinarily unfair. If the rest of the world gave up their price controls, the other rich countries, I should say, gave up their price controls, two things would happen. We would get a lot more new cures developed uh, because we'd get a lot more research and development. There would be a lot more of an incentive to invest in it. And the best evidence we have, the best research we have shows we'd get about 10 to 13 new drugs per year if they loosen price controls in the other rich countries. But we would also get lower prices in the U.S. uh, through more competition, uh, driving down prices as the those more treatments came online and those R&D costs uh, being spread globally. So I, I, we've got a big problem. The, the, the difficulty, Greg, is how do you fix it? Because how do you convince other countries they ought to be paying higher prices? That's very difficult for them politically uh, for the same reasons it would be here. Um, yeah, that's, that's here certainly true. And we'll get to the fixes here, at least the proposed fixes, in just a second. But uh, do you have any numbers on how big of a burden this is becoming for Americans who have to deal with these rising prices? You know, I don't have any. I don't have anything that quantifies it, uh, sort of on an economy-wide basis. But the disparity is large and growing, and you know, I think that that's why the president, uh, you know, made this such a central focus on the campaign trail, and why his administration is so focused on lowering drug prices. Uh, you know, people feel it. Uh, there's no question about that. This is a political pain point right now for American consumers. All right, so let's talk about, first of all, what you think he's doing right, and that is going after exactly what you mentioned, that uh, other companies are putting price controls on these things. And so he's going after it in trade negotiations, trying to trade, uh, change trade policies in order to um, make the price disparity go away and bring in more revenues, as you said, so the prices could potentially come down uh, for American consumers as well, or at least level the playing field. Uh, how's he doing that, and uh, what's the smart way to go about that angle? Well, this has been a uh, major priority of the U.S. Trade Representative Bob Lighthizer uh, in all of our negotiations with other countries is getting them to loosen their price controls and to Im- improve the patent protections uh, as well. And that's a related issue. The ability to defend intellectual property in this space is crucial to being able to get a return on that research and development investment. And uh, yeah, there was a major report. They do an annual report at USTR on intellectual property issues. It's called the Special 301 Report, and uh, pharmaceuticals uh, were a 
major uh, point of emphasis in the most recent report, and it's clearly uh, something that the USTR is working very hard on. And there's some significant improvements in the new USMCA in particular, uh, the NAFTA successor, versus the previous agreement. Uh, protections for biological drugs in particular are much stronger uh, than they were in the past, and that'll help spread some of the costs of developing those biotech drugs uh, you know, to Canada and Mexico. So they're making uh, major efforts, and they've shown some results but you know, it's a very difficult process to convince other countries to, to loosen their price controls or to uh, strengthen their protection of intellectual property for, uh, for U.S. drugs. What's our leverage? What can we, um, I don't know if threaten's the right word, but what can we do if they don't um, play ball with us here? Well, you know, there's not much, unfortunately. Uh, you know, one of the one of the questions that I get a lot is people say, well, why don't these drug companies just tell these countries they won't sell to them if they don't raise their prices? And, uh, you know, the problem with that is if you try to do that, the other country will typically just steal your patent and uh, have a local company produce it without compensating you or compensating you even lower. And we saw that in India, uh, not under the current prime minister, but under the previous prime minister, they stole about 10 cancer drugs. They said, well, you know, you're not giving us the price we want. We're going to steal your patent and we'll have someone produce it ourselves. And so unless you are going to back it up with, with some diplomatic power and threats of retaliation and tariffs and sort of all the other tools in the toolbox, there's not much that the companies themselves can do um, to, to resist foreign price controls. And I think that's why it's so important that the Trump administration is putting it on the table in these larger negotiations in the context of these larger deals that they're working, because you're never going to convince another country that they ought to loosen their price controls just because it's the right thing to do, even though you know, I do think they would benefit if there's more R&D investment, more cures. I mean, that would benefit everyone globally. But I think you really just have to drive a hard bargain with sort of the other parameters of the things on the table in the trade negotiations and, uh, and, and kind of force it as a concession. So there's a two-pronged approach here. That's one, uh, trying to uh, make progress on, on the trade front, as you mentioned, through the trade representative. The other seems to be uh, sort of a, if you can't beat them, join them uh, approach from Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar. You wrote an op-ed in the last few days saying that Azar is now proposing setting prices for drugs in the Medicare Part B program, which are doctor-administered drugs, with a formula based on foreign price controls. So he's doing the same thing here. How would it work? And why is this a recipe for disaster in your estimation? Well, you know, the argument here uh, from the Trump administration, they're saying, you know, Medicare Part B is essentially, uh, you know, a government-run system, and so we should pay prices like the other government-run systems in other countries uh, rather than market-based prices. Um, the problem with that type of thinking is, you know, it, it's sort of a camel's nose under the tent, I think, for broader price controls in the U.S. market. If you start in the Medicare Part B program and you say, okay, we're linking to foreign prices, we're going to pay below market government set prices uh, you know, based on the, the prices in other countries, uh, we're going to start in Medicare Part B, but it, it would spread pretty rapidly uh, beyond that, I think. And uh, eventually, you have sort of a government price control approach for the U.S. market that mirrors what we have in other countries, which which feels good in the near term. We're paying less. That seems good. Um, but that would completely undermine the incentives for R&D in developing new cures. And instead of the rest of the world free riding on us, there would be nobody to free ride off of. There would be no place to earn a market return on research and development. So I do worry that it leads to broader price controls over time and, and undermines uh, the, the incentives for cures. I also, the other problem I have with it, Greg, is I think it undermines our trade negotiations. Because if you're sitting down with another party and you're trying to drive a hard bargain, get them to loosen their price controls, and they can respond with, hey, if our price controls are so bad, why are you linking your prices to ours in this demonstration program in Medicare? Uh, I think that's awfully hard to respond to. Are there any other approaches you think would be a good tandem with the trade negotiations, or is it pretty much those negotiations are bust here? Well, uh, you know, I think it. I think that in terms of the disparity between domestic and foreign prices, uh, you've got to deal with it in the trade context. But I will commend. Uh, there's a brand new initiative that HHS has just announced uh, on uh, hidden rebates, uh, kickbacks. They uh, essentially are. Uh, there's an exemption from the anti-kickback statute that's allowed these deals where pharmaceutical benefit managers will, uh, every time you go in and pay for a drug, they'll get a big rebate uh, back from the manufacturer, but they have not been passing those on to customers. They've been pocketing them. Uh, there is a new proposed rule from HHS that would essentially require uh, any rebate to be returned to the customer at the point of sale, or else it would be an anti 
kickback provision uh, would kick in and prevent that uh, rebate. And that I, I haven't looked at all the details of the new proposed rule yet, uh, but in principle, that's a, a pretty good positive, I think, uh, that could give some people relief at the register. So uh, they are doing other things uh, that could be beneficial, but I think the, the idea of linking our prices to foreign prices uh, is a counterproductive one. So exit question here, Phil. What's your level of optimism on the trade negotiations in particular paying off? Well, you know, I think the um, it, it's hard to say what will happen on USMCA. As I mentioned, uh, there are some significant improvements uh, for drug pricing in that agreement. But with Democrats controlling the House, it's not clear what their pound of flesh might be. And I, I do expect there are going to have to be changes to that agreement. I, I'm not sure uh, whether it'll get uh, ratified or not. But if it did get ratified, that would be a significant positive step. And of course, you know, we've got to watch. Uh, negotiations are ongoing with a lot of other countries. And, uh, you know, the, the clock's ticking now. We've got two years left in this first term. And if President Trump's not reelected, it's unclear how many of these trade efforts will actually uh, be seen through to conclusion. And so uh, we might not get much done on that front uh, unless President Trump is reelected just from a timeline standpoint. But I do know they're working very hard on it. So I'm hoping that we will see some progress. We'll be watching, certainly. Phil, thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate it. All right. My pleasure. Phil Kirpin is president of American Commitment. I'm Greg Corumbus reporting for Radio America.